Ian is Ian Prosser is going to give the, the lecture. Um, I haven't got anything prepared to normally I'd say about what Ian's done and his background and so on, but he's an adjunct professor at the Institute for Applied Ecology and the Center for Water Applied Water Science. Um, you know, a real topical um, issue about um, um, adapting our water management in the Murray Darling because of climate changing. So I'll pass over to Ian. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, hang on, I'll just minimize this. Okay, so this is um, some work I've done with uh, previous colleagues at CSIRO. I, I used to work before I retired from full time work. Uh, I used to work as the science director for the water flagship at CSIRO uh, many years ago now, almost it seems. Uh, but this is a, a paper that I did with Francis Chu and Mark Stafford Smith from CSIRO. Um, I'll give the full reference later, but a paper we did this year that are reviewing how well adapted water management is in the Murray Darling Basin to forthcoming uh, climate change. Francis and Mark are both apologies. Francis actually has a meeting on the Murray Darling Basin today. And Mark said he may be able to join in for questions. So uh, he's, he's a climate adaptation expert. So any questions on that, I'd be glad to leave to him. Um, so let's... Right. So the, really the question is, is the basin plan well adapted to climate change? And the, the reason I got into this is there've been quite divergent statements about this over the year. years. And uh, in fact, there's one recent one came out of the um, Ice Warm Centre that said, by successfully managing water, Australia has a secret weapon in the fight against climate change, that we lead the world in those sorts of things. Uh, and coming out of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority itself in 2015, they said the water management arrangements provide a solid foundation to respond to a changing climate. So there's those who think they're very well positioned, but there are um, dissenting views. And others such as a group at ANU have said that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan fails to deal adequately with climate change. Uh, the problem with all of these statements is they tend to be uh, opinion ones that take a, a, a fairly a superficial look at the policies and don't really evaluate them against the objectives that we have for the basin plan. So against things like the hydrology of the basin and then how that flows through to um, ecological and socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, so we decided in this paper to dive a bit deeper and to sort of critically evaluate uh, what, what is likely to happen to those outcomes under climate change and, and uh, therefore how well adapted it is and how could we improve adaptation if there's uh, any you know, shortcomings that we find. Um, so oh, so the, the one line summary, if, you, uh, if you've got a very busy Friday and you need to leave, is that the short answer we believe is that the basin plan is not as well adapted as it needs to be given the change coming. But I will explain. So the outline of the talk is, first of all, what's the future climate likely to look like? What, what is it that we're going to need to adapt to? Uh, and are recent droughts that we've had related to climate change or have they just been bad luck under the current climate? And so that then is a background to then how well will current management deal with climate change? I'll look at that by looking at how well, essentially our argument is that uh, future drier climate will involve more intense and frequent droughts. And so how well our current management deals with droughts will give some indicator how we'll go with, with climate change. And then the timing of this work is um, uh, not sort of incidental. It's very much uh, uh, in the context that in 2026, the basin plan, there needs to be a, 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 public, a basin plan review uh, and an update to the basin plan. So it's probably going to start around 2024. Uh, and so now is a good, oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Got to put my phone on side. Uh, so now is a good time to start thinking about how, how that basin plan review might be approached uh, because it has, has been stated that climate change will be considered in that basin plan review. Uh, 
So starting out, what the, the hydrology and climate of the basin uh, to date in, in history. So uh, Murray Darling Basin hydrology is actually quite distinct uh, from, from many large other large basins in the world. It has an extremely high, has high year to year variability in flows amongst the highest variability in the world. And you can see that this is annual uh, inflows to the Murray Darling Basin uh, year by year. Which each bar is a year, and you can see we, you know, we always talk about averages in the basin. So an average inflow of nine thousand, uh, sorry, an average flow. This is it uh, down in Wentworth of nine thousand gigalitres a year, and uh, in the Murray system, uh, and you can see that you know there are there are years with far greater flows than that, and many years with with far less. Now the last twenty years has had an average almost half of that. And then if you look at the driest 10% of years in the last uh, 25 or so years, six of the 11 driest 10% of years have occurred in the last 25% of years and uh, only five in the previous 100 of, uh, a bit under 100. Uh, so that might start to, to suggest that um, the climate change is already happening. But it, that, could, that could just be a, a bad luck, bad roll of the dice. There have been other multi-year periods of low flows. You see there are a few years of above average flow there. And then this year is likely to be an above average flow as well. So uh, with this very high variability, it's very hard to, to tell about climate change. We'll get to that later. Um, the other feature of, of our, our hydrology uh, is that it's very sensitive to fluctuations in climate. So um, hydrologists, we call this the uh, rainfall uh, and uh, elasticity. So that uh, in uh, our catchments, uh, or catchments up and down East Coast Australia, Eastern half of Australia, you, you tend to get an elasticity of, of 2.5 and sometimes as high as four. So that means, so an elasticity of three would mean a 10% reduction in rainfall would lead to a 30% reduction in runoff. So that's a high sensitivity that the change in rainfall is then exaggerated in a change in runoff. And that's partly because of where we sit. You need sort of quite unusual conditions to get runoff. We're, we're in a fairly uh, water limited landscape. Now that doesn't occur in many other, particularly uh, Northern Hemisphere water basins. It does occur in some other African water basins and things, but it, it's not something that always occurs. So our hydrology is more sensitive to climate uh, than, than many other basins in the world. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are some strong oceanic and atmospheric drivers. We often think of El Nino, La Nina, the way we know that they, those drivers are strongly linked uh, to, our, to rainfall and then through to hydrology. In fact, some of those uh, we're able to predict in advance, at least a season in advance, how they're, they're going to uh, be expressed in the hydrology. Other drivers are things like the Indian Ocean Dipole, Southern Annular Mode, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, sort of global atmospheric and ocean drivers that drive our rainfall and hydrology. So that's, that's the, the background. Now, so well, getting back to this question then of, of have, has that decline in the last 20 years just been bad luck or is it perhaps an indicator of future climate change? Uh, there are some indications that it's climate change. So there have been systematic changes uh, in, in global atmospheric circulation related to global warming. So we've had 1.5 degrees of warming in the Australian continent already uh, compared to the historical climate. Uh, and one of the strong features of, of the climate is, the, is this um, the, the Hadley cell. So you get uh, um, an, under an intense heating, high solar radiation in, in the tropics, uh, warm moist air rises, then uh, travels south and north to the subtropics and descends, and that's where we get these. So the descending air is high pressure. So we get these high pressure systems of stable air, and in between those, uh, we tend to get cold fronts. So in the uh, winter months, and, and we are uh, southern Australia and the southern Murray Darling Basin, most of the water, most of the water resources are generated by by winter uh, cool season uh, rainfall rather than the warm season rainfall. Now, so, that, uh, sub, so, so that's called the subtropical ridge, those high pressure systems, and the intensity of that subtropical ridge has actually increased 
in historical times, uh, which is the blue line there. So that's just the average pressure of, the, of those high pressure systems. And you can see it's increased uh, in correlation with global annual temperature increases. Now, so as well as increasing, these high pressure systems have also been pushed further south. So this Hadley cell is bigger than it used to be. So a lot of the cold fronts and the, and the rain bearing, uh, this has been up to summarizing here, this has been investigated in more detail. I've just, I'm not showing all those details, but it has been shown that the rain bearing weather patterns have been pushed south of our continent and are not occurring as, as frequently in the southern half of the Australian continent. So there's some good evidence. Uh, so we, we know there's observations of, of warming, of global warming and warming of the Australian continent. And there's good cause and effect evidence uh, that that has resulted in reduced rainfall uh, through to reduced runoff. So, so that those recent reductions could be uh, indicators of climate change and what's to come. But we've only got 100 years of, of record. And if you look at the millennium drought, which in the southern basin is the worst drought uh, we've ever had. So that's the period 1997 to 2009. And you can do you know, statistical analysis of the historical record, and that shows that it does have a recurrence interval of 100 years or so. So, you know, maybe there was an element of just bad luck, or maybe it was climate change. Uh, but that's a pretty short interval to be looking at a multi year drought like that. So, one, one thing that's being done to sort of to further look at the significance of that drought is to compare uh, centuries. Uh, the historic last historical century, which precedes the millennium drought, uh, with, with centuries over the last thousand years using surrogate uh, paleoclimatic records. So these, these might be speleothem records of uh, you know, iso oxygen isotopes, other isotopes and things. So there, so there are these analog records of climate, uh, which through the historical period can be correlated uh, with our climate observations. So that then, uh, in, in a crude sense, so the way this has done, been done in this paper here by Flack and others last year, is they classified the climate into dry, dry times, neutral times, and wet times, and looked at the frequency of each over the century, uh, and then used, so that's in the historical time, and then used these paleoclimatic records to do the same for the last thousand years. So this histogram here is, is that uh, surrogate record from from 11 paleoclimate analogues over the last thousand years. What's interesting is this, is that there is some structure to this. This doesn't, if you, would, if you just think of uh, dry years as uh, tossing uh, tails on a coin and wet years as tossing heads, this doesn't really look like just random coin toss. We had uh, 500 years with, with no dry periods uh, and some very frequent uh, sorry, no wet periods and some very frequent kinds uh, of dry conditions. And then we went into a more mixed thing, uh, 500 years, which we last 100 years seems to have been, been part of. So there seems to be a bit of structure here. But in terms of broad climate, the broad climate, and when people think of the Holocene, the last 10,000 years has been fairly stable climate. Uh, so there's, there's quite small shifts in climate here. And, and what's interesting is there are small shifts in some of those climate drivers like El Nino, La Nina and uh, the uh, Indian Ocean Dipole. Uh, there have been centuries and, and longer than century periods where, where those features are stronger. And that may be what's going on, on here. So there is quite a lot more variability uh, in our, probably in our hydrology uh, in, in the rainfall of, and the rainfall of Murray Darling Basin than we've seen uh, in the last hundred years. And now we're changing that situation. So rather than this being this sort of pattern being a response to uh, climate change, we're now actually actively driving climate change uh, ourselves, anthropogenic climate change. And so we should expect you know, similar magnitude changes here to our hydrological regime. So once again, some more evidence that if we're going to tamper with the climate like we are, we might be expecting to see some quite uh, dramatic changes to basin hydrology. So this moving then to projections of future basin hydrology. Uh, so these are projections for the uh, 2046 to 2075 period based on, I think it's, uh, I've forgotten now, to a, 
uh, in relative to the 1970 and sort of 1990 climate. Now, there's a range of predictions, but uh, the median prediction from the global climate models is about a 20% uh, decrease in runoff across the basin. Uh, the wettest uh, predictions from the models suggest it could get a, a bit wetter, or even the very southern basin, though it still comes out drier. And then the driest 10 percentile of those predictions uh, came out, it could be extremely dry, it could be 40 percent drier uh, than the historical climate. There's quite a bit of variability here. Variability in, in rainfall predictions and runoff predictions is, is uh, inevitable. Global climate modelling is getting is, is pretty accurate and it's been demonstrated to be accurate for temperature, but uh, you know it's much more local weather patterns of things that drive rainfall and then there's uncertainties about how rainfall translates to runoff. And so there's always going to be uncertainties uh, in these projections. But this uh, projection of a drying of the Murray-Darling Basin has been consistent now uh, since the 1990s. So as uh, climate models get better, as we better understand the processes that are generating rainfall, some of the stuff I talked about, uh, gives us much better understanding, much better confidence in these projections. Uh, but the basic projection has stayed the same since the 1990s, that we're at, we can get about a, you know, at least 20, uh, high probability of 20% or more uh, reduction in runoff. Now, where that really drives impact, though, you know, people always talk about sort of median and average uh, conditions, but it's the extremes. That often that really matter. So this is the same projections, but expressed in a different way. This is now expressed in how frequent will uh, droughts be. So this is taking what a three-year droughts, uh, because they, they tend to be the ones that have the you know, multi-year droughts tend to be the ones that have the biggest impact on water management. So it's taking a three-year drought and a three-year drought of the intensity of a one in 20 years. So the uh, so you the sort of drought you might get five times in a hundred years on average uh, of a, of a three-year duration. Now, so the median prediction is that that's going to increase in frequency to perhaps once every as much as once every ten years. So uh, it's not quite the same, as, as, but but you could express that then as sort of three years on ten uh, will be uh, be dry, but it could be as bad as uh, one in five years. Uh, so a 40% reduction in mean annual uh, runoff doesn't mean you'll get that. We're still gonna have that variability. Uh, and so a, we could get three in five years on average uh, in, the, in the future, as bad as, as the uh, one in 20 year drought. So the other way of showing this is to project forward this uh, mean annual, so if we take uh, back to the 1990s, the mean annual runoff to that date, what might it do into the, into the future? And see, so range of predictions could stay the same, uh, could get worse. But by 2050, which remember is only 30 years away now, uh, some of the, the worst uh, predictions from climate models suggest that the last 20 years uh, could be the new median. Now, of course, on top of that, you're going to still have these red dot years. You're still going to have this sort of variability that we have, this very high variability is going to be on top of that. Uh, but there's going to be increased frequency of droughts. Uh, now we don't know, you know, the variability could change and that's uh, very hard to, to predict. But if we assume the variability was the same, uh, then you're going to have a lot more frequent years you know, way down here uh, and much less years of these above average uh, flows. So we're going to have more frequent and more intense droughts. Now, so that's that's the, um, we went a bit longer than I should have there, but anyway, that's the background to uh, water management uh, into the future. So then we critically, now I'm gonna critically review how well the basin plan as it currently stands is likely to deal with that. So they've used published data and recent literature to evaluate the outcomes in recent droughts, then as an analog for outcomes in future more frequent and extreme droughts. I've also gone and looked at the regional water sharing plans and that are um, subsidiary to the basin plan itself to see how they are dealing with climate change risks. They, they all have to have a risk management plan and climate change is one of those risks. And the other reason for doing this is that, is that it's been acknowledged that climate change wasn't dealt with in the original basin plan, but governments have come out and said they will deal with it in 2026. Uh, so how, 
So it'd be good to see what that would, review would need to do. So I'm going to set out uh, six ways that I, you know, we believe uh, six deficiencies or six ways the basin plan could better adapt to climate change. First of all, uh, there are uneven sharings of the impact of climate change between consumptive water users and the environment. And so the environment is going to bear more of the impact than consumptive users. Uh, uncertainties in the water balance are quite significant and they become more significant the drier, uh, the less runoff you get and the drier it gets. And once again, the environment disproportionately bears uh, the impact of, those, of not considering those uncertainties or, or if those uncertainties are higher than we think. Another third improvement that needs to be made uh, is that stochastic scenarios of future flow should be considered uh, rather than the base of water planning just on the historical record. I'll go into that more detail because of quirks in the historical record. Uh, then we also need to assess vulnerabilities to climate change because they're going to be quite uneven across uh, the basin. Uh, and we're probably going to need to prioritise objectives and assets regionally because not everything is going to be able to be protected as we move to a drier climate. Uh, when it comes to things like water sharing plans, I'm going to show that there are some, some um, inadvertent limits of using a 10 year future planning horizon, uh, that they've limited the, the sorts of considerations that are put into the basin plan and that that can be fixed by using things like climate adaptation frameworks to manage a lot of these, these, these issues of uncertainty and longer time planning. So that's sort of where I'm going now. So uneven sharing arrangements. Uh, so what's, this is uh, a plot of uh, annual flow at Wentworth under natural conditions. So what the, the flow would have been at Wentworth, which is the point of maximum flow in the Murray River under natural conditions, and then the level of use. It's just, uh, in, and, and this is the historical record. This is the last hundred years or so. Uh, so it's the level of use under current uh, all the current uh, water entitlements and things. Uh, so what it's useful to show is this is this uh, the impacts of this huge variability. So whilst the uh, on average the, about uh, fifty eight percent of of total natural flow that would have been at Wentworth is now extracted, and the flow on average is fourteen hundred uh, gigalitres at Wentworth below the confluence of the Darling. Uh, what actually happens is there's, there's a huge difference and there's an inverse correlation between annual flow and level of use. So in, in wet years, you get a lot of rainfall, you don't actually need much irrigation. Uh, there's not much demand for irrigation, so use is actually quite low. And then in dry years, what gets disturbing is 70, so in 25% of the years, over 70% of, of the actual water that would naturally have been in the river is extracted and it can be as high as 80%. And given things like water losses, uh, uncertainties in the volume of flow, that then leaves very little water uh, for the environment or other, other uses. Uh, so that's illustrated in, in a different way in this histogram. So if we take an, an average year, which is what, what's often you know, given as the statistics over the uh, basin plan. So on average year, this much water used for consumption. We've now returned this much in terms of environmental water entitlement, so it's still in water that's uh, in entitlements and annual allocations, but is given to the environment. Then you've got planned, which one else come planned and unplanned environmental water. So this is uh, planned environmental water is things like uh, stopping extractions at low flow or, or translucency of, of dams. And then unplanned water is just the water that uh, benefits the environment that no one else happens to be using and everybody just lets it flow down the river and does all sorts of good things for the environment. Uh, and then on top of that, there's uncertainty in the water balance. Now there's about 15% uh, uncertainty in the water balance. This is uh, things like uh, runoff not behaving uh, in relation to rainfall quite as you would expect, uh, unexpectedly, unexpected losses in the system, uh, illegal water extractions, uh, things like that. Uh, and and uh, uh, things that are not well measured, so we just don't know how much water is going to groundwater or to floodplain, lo floodplain losses, those sorts of things. Uh, so, fifteen percent on an average water year uh, doesn't is you know fairly small compared to these other two big portions. 
Uh, in a wet year, as I say, water use actually goes down, heaps of water for the environment, floodplain flows and things like that, great outcomes and things. The problems come into these dry years where you've got uh, 70 to 80 percent of water is actually being, even though only 56 percent on average in dry years, 70 to 80 percent of water is being consumed. You've got some of that is now going to environmental water in entitlements. There's very little water left uh, in terms of planned and unplanned water, just some low flows. And now things like the uncertainty in the water balance is, is a bigger term than that unplanned environmental water. So the issue is that we're going to be going from this being average, we could end up to this being the new median condition or perhaps somewhere in between. So we set a basin plan setting on this, setting saying this is a fair sharing arrangement in the future. That's, that sharing arrangement is not going to be maintained and it's the environment that's going to take a hit. Now you could say, well, let's just stop, let's just make it 50% 56%, and let's not have this uh, variation in use between wet and dry years. But that's the whole basis for irrigated agriculture is to maintain uh, con you know, consistent water supplies uh, and, and get, get around that high climate variability, that rainfall variability. It's actually been shown that it's better to do this sharing arrangement, uh, low water, you know, more water for the environment in wet years and more relatively more for the users in dry years actually benefits both uh, water ecosystems and uh, consumptive use of water. So you don't want to really get rid of that, but that works. And so that, that's our sort of annual allocation regime. That works, that's a fantastic adaptation to a variable climate, but it's not a great adaptation to a changing climate. So we've got to think about then, do we have to sort of reset this balance to a drying climate? And I'll, I'll come back to that later, but that's the, that's the fundamental problem that under a drying climate, our, the sharing arrangement we set up under the basin plan is going to be eroded. Okay, the second problem, limitations of the historical record. So the way water planning is done at the, the moment is we use this record back to the 1900, we, we test water management arrangements. So water sharing plans and things uh, in each state and the basin plan itself was tested against this 100 year period. The, the logic being that we've had so much variability of flows that if something can work throughout this period, it's going to work under pretty well any circumstance because 100 years is a, you know, it's, it's picking up all the climate variability. You'll have extreme droughts, extreme wet years. You're going to figure out uh, what works and what doesn't work. Turns out that's not true. Uh, so, for example, uh, this is some work that uh, QJ Wang and others did at, at Melbourne University. Uh, so, uh, this bar here. Uh, so this is a good, medium, intermediate, poor and, and critical out, uh, conditions of Barma Millawa forest in relation to, to uh, its flow requirements. Uh, so these are flood replenishing flood flows here in, in asterisk. So this is the historical record. And you see going into the millennium drought, there were a couple of good floods, but there was a, a, a gradual diminishing of the condition of the Barma Millawa forest. Uh, so if you're just doing the historical record, that's the sort of history of condition you'll get at the Barma Millawa forest and how resilient it is to something like the Millennium Drought. The problem is that was very much reliant on getting this replenishing flow here. So if you run a stochastic se sequence with the same variability and uh, median condition as history, you can get some quite different outcomes. If that flow there is delayed all the way to here, then the condition of Barma Millawa Forest goes into poor uh, critical conditions, uh, poor conditions much earlier and for much longer. Or if that flood was later, you actually get less. Uh, you, the, the condition coming out of the millennial drought is actually much better uh, for the Barma Millawa Forest. So it, it does show that the historical record has all sorts of quirks in it, and we should be using a, a, a much more probabilistic basis for look, uh, because the problem is once something's in critical condition uh, and once something's gone and extinct, it's going to take a long term time to come back. So you want to be avoiding these circumstances and understanding their probability. Now the same occurs for consumptive water use. Much, much has been said about how well water trade worked in the Millennium Drought. So this is an example, so for all of, of the outcomes for irrigated agriculture in the Millennium Drought, 
So there was uh, only 30% water use uh, reduced to 30% in the millennium drought of the long-term average, but it, the uh, value, the gross value of ir irrigated agricultural product only um, production only reduced by 20%. Everyone said, and that's all because of the, you know, we allowed water trade, uh, people uh, had incentives with the water price to become more um, efficient in their irrigated agriculture. Now, yes, all those things occurred. But what's often not, not said is one of the, you know, well, there's two things to point out here. One is whilst that overall outcome is great, uh, it didn't happen everywhere for, for all sectors. So rice still took a huge hit. Uh, irrigated meat industry took a hit. Dairy uh, took a bit of a hit as, as well. Cotton took a hit, annual crop. That was then balanced by some other products which actually increased in gross value. Well, why would that be? So that's partly because there was a, a, a situation in the millennium drought that the global prices for these commodities was very high. And so that's partly what mitigated uh, the, the problems of the millennium drought. Now, once again, a bit like the environmental example, not, you're not gonna hit that happy coincidence in all future droughts. So another reason why you'd want to do a statistical analysis uh, and, and look at, you know, once again, what's the probability? And it's the same as the environment. You know, once, once, particularly for these permanent crops and things, once something fails, you're not able to keep that crop going or, or the business fails because it doesn't make any money for a few years and the, and the banks close it. Uh, once again, it's hard to come back. So, anyway, so just relying on the historical record uh, isn't good enough. We should be looking at future climate scenarios, but not just scaling the history. historical one. We need to be doing that stochastically. Now, the next thing is we then need to be looking at these vulnerabilities to change, and they're going to be different across different uh, regions and different uh, different uh, water use sectors or, or different sectors with interest in in water. Uh, so, in uh, so this just a. Uh, some environmental assets, for example, some of the major assessed environmental assets that went into the uh, basin plan, things and a, and a whole bunch of others, uh, their vulnerabilities to climate change are going to be very different. We probably don't fully understand those yet. One, one example is high floodplains, uh, which, you know, which require occasional uh, high magnitude floods, particularly things to, to do things like flushing out salt that accumulates on them. Uh, they're the hardest things to change naturally. So though the, the frequency of those floods might change, uh, get less frequent in future, but environmental entitlements aren't going to do anything for that. They're very hard things to change with any kind of management, but the volumes of water are just too huge. You can't create a major flood out of nothing. So water ecosystems that rely on those are going to be quite vulnerable to climate change. Uh, downstream systems tend to be more vulnerable than upstream systems because the change to the hydrology is greater there and harder to, to change. Anyway, a whole bunch of things. So they'll be different. And there'll also be different values. You know, some of these, uh, some of these are Ramsar internationally listed wetlands, very important for international migratory birds, for example. Others are of, of local value, things like that. Same applies for water consumption. So already, you know, as I mentioned, things like rice and dairy are being impacted. So just saying that, oh, well, you know, agricultural production across the basin is fine, that, that the average or overall socioeconomic circumstances are fine. There are regions that are really struggling and saying they need help. Uh, and so it's very uh, poor comfort to them to just say, oh, well, that's okay, you're all right. You're, you're just working to the greater good. Uh, things, are, things are good overall, so don't worry. So there's, there's once again, going to be quite different vulnerabilities and then the other point is, is on things that uh, not all water uses are even well managed under the current sharing arrangements. So indigenous water use, for example, places like the Gwaida wetlands, are, uh, which have you know, quite high indigenous value, uh, um, and there, but there is nothing in the current water uh, management arrangements that reflects that. You know, they're going to be more vulnerable in the future. So we even need to catch up our current management, let alone uh, to, to drier conditions, to be managing all interests uh, evenly. So we, we are going to look at vulnerabilities to change and they're going to be quite different region to region. Okay, uh, now the next big one, this 10 year planning horizon. So the basin plan is reviewed every 10 years, but that first review is mentioned coming in 20, 
26. And then underneath that, the states have their 10 year uh, regional or valley water sharing plans. Uh, and so yeah, they're reset every 10 years. And those valley plans have to be accredited by the MDBA, MDBA as being compliant with the basin plan. And all of those plans have to include a climate change risk. So you can look at that and say, well, this is, this is fantastic. Adaptive management is it's actually legislated. Plans are adapted every 10 years. What could go wrong? If this uh, should work really well. So then let's have a look at those, those current 10 year plans and how they're dealing with climate change. So, the, so the, these are um, quotes from those, so I looked, I reviewed all the, all the accredited uh, water sharing plans and none of them have made adaptations to climate change. Uh, all of them uh, deal with climate change as a risk, but, but one that doesn't require uh, any change to management arrangements. So they say things like climate change is small compared to the uncertainty, the next 10 years, uh, current management can cope with it, seasonal allocations, all those things we do well at the moment. Uh, others say, well, because of the uncertainty, we need to do some climate change research and figure out impacts. And when we understand it better, we'll, then maybe we'll, we'll do something. Uh, the worst I, I found was one regional water sharing plan, which to protect the guilty, I won't say where it was, but it said uh, climate change is uncontrollable, which probably is within that region. So there's no risk mitigation. So you may not be able to mitigate it in the region, but you sure might need to adapt to it. Anyway, all of that summarizes to, in a 10 year time horizon, nothing much is going to change. Uh, so we'll deal with climate later. That's the, the, the basic policy response in all of those uh, water sharing plans. Now, the fundamental issue with that is you could iterate that. I mean, all those statements are true. It, climate won't change much in the next 10 years and there is uncertainty and, and there's huge in year to year variability. So you could iterate that, you could make those same statements in each 10 year review of these plans for the next century. Meanwhile, so you can just say each 10 years, mm, not much can change the next 10 years. So meanwhile, the basin is completely transformed, both in terms of climate and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and, and meanwhile, the water plans have not changed. So um, is there a chat message? Um, yeah, all right, I'll deal with questions at the end. <laughs> Uh, I'll get rid of that. Right. So now the other, so anyway, so there's a problem of just taking a 10 year time horizon, which you need to take longer. Now, the other problem with taking a, a 10 year is saying we're going to adapt the plan every 10 years is that if you remember back to that first basin plan, it took more than 10 years to do that. that was a really substantial water reform. It's sort of uh, summarized humorously here in a, in a cartoon by Kadelka. Now, do we really want to go through that major transformation every 10 years of, of completely revisiting what the balance is between uh, water consumption uh, and water for the environment? It, it takes about 10 years to go through that process. One of the promises of water reform, one of the promises of the National Water Initiative was that, it was, was that whilst there might be water taken from irrigation and returned back to the environment, uh, that it was going to provide certainty into the future so that long-term decisions could be made. Now, if you're saying you're going to change things like the diversion limit every 10 years, that's actually going against that, telling people they're going to have certainty in the future. If you're saying you're going to, going to look at climate change every 10 years, that would undermine that. So we need some other approach. Um, right, now the other, the other one of approach that's been suggested is that we just look back into uh, at, the, at, the, at the previous 10 years of the plan and say, do we need to, you know, rather than projecting uncertain future climate, just say, has the climate changed? Uh, now, I'll illustrate the problems with that by looking at the, the situation of inflows to Perth uh, reservoirs, Perth's water supply system. So at the moment, I've, I've just shown through to 1970, a climate change has already occurred uh, which has reduced these water flows. But I would challenge anyone with that inter-year uh, inter variability of flows to tell me where that climate change is. Now we could jump. Uh, jump forward a few years. And you can say, well, is, is there, can you see that climate change now? You, you might say that there's a declining uh, flows here from high flows down to low, but you can find previous times where there was a you know, run of declining. Uh, 
flats, giving you only occasionally get very high flats. So then you can go forward a few more years. And knowing that there's a climate change here, you might start to say, aha, yes, I'm starting to see low flows there. Go forward a few more years. And I think maybe perhaps coming back a bit better, aren't huh? quite so bad. A few more years. Yes, perhaps you've picked it by now. And then going through, I've only got to 2010 on this, but that, that uh, low flows has continued now right through to 2020. So that the flow, the, the climate changes, uh, the flow actually starts, statistical analysis shows that it started back here sometime in the early 60s, that climate started to change, even though some people draw it as a step change in 1975, just because of, because of that. So if we look at a, the response in Western Australia to that, in the 1980s, about here, water managers started to get concerned. But there were plenty of others who sort of said, look, we've, we've had runs of dry years before. It would, you know, we can't just assume this is climate change. It could just have been you know, a bit of bad luck. We just had, had quite a few dry years in a row. The next major response was that the Indian Ocean Climate Initiative, which was a climate change research program, started in 1998. So by then, people are saying something seems to be happening here. We need to know what it is. There was no climate adaptation. There was just a, a, a very well conducted research program which showed that the climate has changed. So then by 1998, the, the inflow sequence was derated. So Perth's water planning then was based on this sequence of flows and completely ignoring all this earlier level, recognising by then that the climate uh, has changed. And then the only actual adaptive response didn't occur until uh, 2006 uh, with the decision to build the uh, desalinization plant to get then started operating in, in 2006. So that's from climate change that occurred in 1960, in the early 1960s. So that's a, that's a 40 year response period. So that, that's clearly not responsive enough. Now, so rather than, than using that historical record and, and saying we can't use projections of climate change because they're uncertain, there are actually a whole bunch of ways uh, that people make good decision uh, making dealing with uncertainty. So one is no regrets decisions, uh, decisions that, that help with climate change, but are just smart to be done anyway. So in, in a water sense, that might be improved water use efficiency, because even if the uh, water availability doesn't decline, you're still going to get better outcomes for the, for the amount of water you've got. Another one is, is reversible and flexible uh, operate options. And so we deal with them now with operational plans for environmental watering that are quite different for wet years than dry years. So those sort of uh, water allocation, seasonal water allocations are one of those as well. So we, we, we already do things like that. You can buy safety margins for the future. So for example, uh, much of the operations in the along the Murray uh, are um, limited by conveyance uh, limits through the Barmer Miller Church. If you got rid of that uh, limit, you could actually improve uh, delivery of water for everyone, for the environment, and for consumers into the future, which would uh, give improved outcomes based to now, even with a declining uh, water supply. You can promote self-adaptation. So things like selective breeding of lower water demand crops and things. Uh, you can reduce decision lifetimes. So rather than building uh, dams, which uh, take a hundred years to pay off and, and last for a hundred years, you might use a climate resilient supply such as uh, groundwater supplies or, so, or supplies which have a shorter life and which can be brought in quicker. It usually takes 10 to 20 years. Uh, between just between uh, thinking about building a dam or when it first uh, starts supplying water. And then the other part of this is that this uncertainty in the future climate is overstated. We know that, well, there's at least a greater than 80% probability of drying in the basin. We know the causal mechanisms quite well. Uh, that that uh, drying trend has been projected, has been predicted consistently since the 1990s. We know it's likely to dry. What we don't know is just exactly when and how bad that's going to be. When. So an uh, analogy that some people give is something like, you know, the 10, 1020 bus, the scheduled 1020 bus is coming. You may not get here at 1020, you may get here at 1025 or 1030, but it's coming. It's a bit like that. Uh, so one of the 
problems with, with this, with these 10 year decision timeframes and saying, oh, it's all a bit uncertain, we don't need to worry about it for another 10 years, is that many of the decisions that are made uh, have, have uh, lifetimes, for, for, as I've been alluding to, far greater than in 10 years. First of all, which I mentioned in the Perth example, uh, and with water reform, there's a lead time. Quite often the big decisions we make uh, take 10 to 20 years to of sort of softening everyone up and, and, and uh, preparations. Then there's the operation time for things so like dams are built that cost billions of dollars to build. You need, uh, need them to be operating for 100 years or so to pay off. And then there's the, any legacies, uh, consequence times as well. Uh, so you've got, these are just some examples. You've got all sorts of things like Ramsar wetland conservation, for example. We're not trying to conserve these wetlands just for the next 10 years. We're trying to keep them viable for at least 100 years. As I mentioned, dams have very long things. Things like intergenerational equity, take a social science example. Um, irrigated tree crops right, need to be uh, given a reliable water supply for at least the next 30 years. There's already analysis suggesting that the big expansion in almond crops probably can't be sustained once all those crops mature uh, in drought years. Uh, water policy reform itself takes about 20 years uh, before it's operation, uh, before you start seeing the benefits. If you think about those uh, 10, you know, we're only, the, the basin plan in 2012 is still not fully implemented in terms of uh, all, all of its elements in, in state uh, actions. Uh, so that's so this 10 year planning uh, cycle tends to neglect all this. So the way of dealing with uh, combining this, this uncertainty about the future and these long time frames is a framework called adaptation pathways. And that recognizes you don't need to make all your decisions now, but you set out a, a framework. So down here, this, this actually is a water supply example. Uh, but it's taken from agriculture in a part of New Zealand. Um, I'm not aware of this framework, we are not aware of this framework being applied to uh, any um, examples of water management in the basin. It has been applied elsewhere in South Australia, but not in basin uh, catchments. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of options uh, here. So these are types of adaptations you could make that we, the sorts of things we've talked about. Uh, and then these things here are, are decision points. And so some of the things you might know regrets and things, some of the things you might want to start doing now, others you may not need to do until the climate dries, but you don't need to make that decision now, but you make the decision about if the climate dries by 10%, then we'll do this. And with the local stakeholders and things, you weigh up these different options. And so this uh, sort of green and yellow one are the preferred options. You don't, you can pursue multiple options at once. Uh, so if you think that uh, in 10 years time, you're going to be pursuing this, you can, light green here is the lead time. So you can start preparing for that option so that when you make the decision, you can implement it quickly. Um, this all comes from um, Thames Valley Estuary and dealing with sea level rise it was the first time this was done and it's been implemented there with things like setting aside land now for barrages that may need to be built in the future, all those sorts of things. So it, this enables you to take a 50-year, say, planning horizon, uh, but without having to make all the decisions now, you're just setting out for everyone. So you're not providing certain, complete certainty of this is exactly how the future is going to be. You're, you're recognising that this, um, the future is a bit uncertain, but you're, you're dealing with it. You're not just pushing in all the decisions down the road. So you have a long-term strategy and people can, can see how their situation so gives that confidence of long-term planning without locking everything, you know, huge decisions in early and wonder, wondering about whether they're going to be white elephants or not. So the, our recommendation would be that this sort of thing gets applied to the basin plan way beyond these, you know, we don't need to deal with climate change sort of state. So to summarise then, um, if I was in charge of the Basin Plan Review and um, I didn't have any political masters or anything, I was free to do whatever I like. To summarise what I've dealt, been talking about, these are the things I'd do. First of all, I didn't talk about this one, but it's important. We need to evaluate the outcomes from, I did a bit, I showed some examples, uh, outcomes from the existing Basin Plan. We need to work out what's worked and what happened, what hasn't, particularly in compared to what we thought would happen. So observed sort of uh, versus expected. Because um, that, that'll, you know, particularly as we've had those dry years, that, that'll help uh, decide what we need to do for the future. 
Uh, that the sustainable diversion limit uh, looks like it will need to be addressed simply because of the uneven impacts of drying into the future will, will undermine the basin plan, with the sharing arrangement that was set. So even if we do nothing, it will be undermined. We do need to explicitly account for early, early part of basin plan in uh, basin plan, the guide to the basin plan, first basin plan did explicitly account for uncertainty. I don't know why, for some reason it was then dropped. Uh, I think it needs to be brought in. There are big uncertainties in the water balance. They impact the environment more because uh, water, diverted water is metered relatively well. Uh, and so that needs to be incorporated into either reduce those uncertainties or incorporate that uncertainty into the analysis. We need to be using multiple stochastic scenarios. And some people are starting to use these in water planning now and projections for 50 years into the future to identify what some of the risks might be and what the probabilities of those risks might be. We need to assess vulnerabilities. Uh, probably are going to need to prioritise assets. We probably can't pretend 50 years into the future that we can protect everything uh, to the degree that we're trying to protect it now. One I haven't talked about, but it's a, it's others have identified as a common problem with water plans, is that their objectives are not specific and measurable. So that the vulnerabilities are not obvious uh, and, and you can't uh, properly assess whether you're actually meeting the objectives because they're uh, expressed in such vague ways, such as uh, avoid degradation of water environments, uh, that you can't actually tell uh, whether you've achieved it or not. Um, so as well as, I'm not saying we get rid of 10 year water sharing plans and things, uh, have them longer, but as, in, as well as then we do need to have a 50 year uh, time frame for planning and we need to look at what are some of the options what's uh, you know, using the stuff i talked about above uh, work out you know what what is the what is the trajectory for the next 50 years and what are the sort of evaluate the future options and which are uh, most attractive and what needs to be done now to uh, to um, help facilitate future choices uh, then the other thing, we need to do all this regionally. Uh, so one of the problems with the, the first basin plan, it was it sort of pretended to you know, look at the whole problem globally. And since then, there's been a, been a whole bunch of uh, you know, regional communities and, and sectors such as uh, indigenous water use or some uh, water consumption sectors saying, well, hang on, we've been, uh, we've been impacted or we're not, uh, we're not benefiting at all fr from this. And so that, that needs to be sorted out. Uh, and so those regional communities and those sectors need to be given a chance to look at those future scenarios and say how they want to adapt. So we probably need a more polycentric sort of governance and, and looking at uh, helping regional communities, working out regional values and, and not just doing the whole thing as a, as a, a central planning exercise. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our review of adaptability of um, the basin plan. Uh, to climate change, which says there are some good things, but there's uh, quite a lot more needs doing. Uh, so that's all in a, in a paper in uh, the journal called Water, International Journal of Water, which is coming out uh, next week. Okay, thanks. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Any questions, anyone? There's a few hands going up. I think Ross has got a question. Is that right, Ross? I have got a question. Um, thanks, Ian. That was um, both uh, super interesting and extremely terrifying. Um, <laughs> the um, social research that's come out, I think, just this week or late last week, was suggesting that only 20% of people now believe that the basin plan is adequately managing water. Yeah. But I guess my fear is that the, the other 80%, 40% think we need to put more water aside for the environment and 40% think we need to put less water aside for the environment. Yeah. And so although people are universal and not liking what we have, uh, how do we find some common ground to generate something to go forward? Because there really does seem to be a sort of a universal dislike of the plan, but a lack of a consensus on what a replacement plan would look like. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm not sure. That's, I mean, that's the tough one. I mean, it, it occurred to me, even in the first iteration of the basin plan, I thought, yeah, it's great that they were doing it, but I thought this is a crazy exercise. 
uh, because it was going, you know, right down the valley. Oh, I thought this is this is going to pit uh, different water values, uh, different values against each other. It's going to pit state versus state, uh, different sectors of agriculture against each other. Just, this is, you know, no one's going to be be happy out of this. Um, so yeah, it's it's a well. I mean, so that's the thing. It is a fundamental trade-off. I think one improvement that can be made, as I mentioned, is that doing it regionally and actually getting regional stakeholders who will you know, interact with each other in local communities, getting them to sort it out themselves rather than have it imposed upon them. I think that is really is one of the, uh, the things. And, and, and so that, I mean, so these adaptation frameworks have been done. Uh, with regional groups and, and do help resolve some of these tensions and, and meet multiple values. So uh, anyway, that's, but yeah, I, I don't know is the short answer. <laughs> if I can do a follow-up, I guess my concern about taking it to a, ba a valley by valley level is that what that will inevitably mean is that people at the bottom end of the system won't get water because people at the top end of the system will say we need more so the reason, that, as you well know, the reason yeah, that it was yeah. nationalised really was because you're trying to manage uh, local pain yeah. for gain. All right. All right. Yeah. So, so what I mean is, I, I guess I, I haven't really, you know, thought through this yet. I'm probably there's probably better policy people than me. Uh, I didn't just want to say here are all the problems, someone else fix them. I did want to uh, be a bit responsible. But I, I guess what I was thinking is that you, so you need the the, the the basin authority to set some overall dimensions that says, look, you know, overall, uh, we, we need to be, you know, because of this problem of uneven sharing of, of the impacts, we need to be returning more water to the you know, environment and, and to, to say something about what the national and international priority ones are. So providing some sort of uh, national, you know, basin wide overview. And, and so that, that way saying we need to look after downstream users. And then within those broad, dimensions then say so this could be you know you're so you you could get this little water you know and perhaps give them several scenarios and say how would you deal with that and and you know what would first of all what would that impact be and then you know so so then compliment so if if a region is going to be uh you know there's all these wonderful kind of like structural adjustment and things like saying acknowledging that and saying okay well you need some help you need some help transitioning out of your current uh, situation to, to something new that's going to take time and take resources that's got to be all part of the, the program so Dwayne had his hand up before but I can't see him are you still there Dwayne yeah Dwayne go ahead um so I was curious Ian, about the um the different implications of stochastic risk versus that sort of long-term trend and whether you can actually balance off one versus the other so uh, for example, if you are, if we if we've been looking only on that hundred year time frame, um, and we don't actually really understand what the next ten years could provide, even with outside of a climate change scenario, um, how much do you think uh, dealing with that sort of um, the potential you know, risk over the next ten years could actually help mitigate the, those longer term changes? Uh, well, not well. I don't know, not particularly well because I think uh, you there there are. A whole bunch of longer term things. I, I really think you have to take a longer term planning horizon. There, there are a whole bunch of things we're doing under the basin plan and other related programs, which have a uh, an implicit life far greater than ten years. But we haven't actually looked at whether, if you take a longer than ten year time frame, they're sensible. Uh, and even you know things like farmers do that. I mean that. So you end up locking things in so that uh, things like general security water entitlements, you know, the, the, the annual allocation varies a lot, but there's an implied security uh, uh, from history that, that people are expecting to be maintained into the future. So you're setting up expectations all the time by saying, oh, yeah, we're just going to try and continue things for, for 10 years. I, I think we've got to start moving away from that. Now, I noticed Mark Stafford-Smith's joined us now. So um, I'm a hydrologist and Mark Stafford-Smith's a climate adaptation expert. So I'm quite welcome, Mark, to answer uh, wherever he feels like it. Um, and there's a little lovely, oh, there's a little conversation going on in the chat, which I think probably covers 
what what I'd say there, <laughs> which are good oh. points. Oh, okay. Yeah, I should open up the chat. Maybe well, let's go to um, look at the chat chat afterwards. But maybe let's go to Will's also got a question. Will Higginson, Will. You want to hey, go yeah, thanks, Ian. That's a really, really great talk. Uh, my comment, my question is around the disproportionate impacts on the environment, particularly during dry years. I think uh, this is very true from the stuff that we've found in the Lachlan River. We've compared model natural with current flow conditions, and we've showed that even during really dry, dry years, where the, where the river would have ceased to flow for a lot of it, we still get floodplain inundation because of the, the, the natural way that the river would have been, been a bit flashy. Oh yeah, yeah. And under a current flow condition, because the, the dams are low, water need, uh, water needs of, of humans, these do not do not happen. They, these these smaller flooding events wouldn't happen, and these are really important for the lower lying parts of the floodplain to to keep the communities going. So how do we address this issue during dry years where the the, the, the human need for water is is high, and obviously it's going to in, in increase in um, importance um, under a drying climate. Yeah, how do we, do we do we address the issue of the disproportionate impact during dry years when there's only so much water to go around? Uh, yeah, I, well, once again, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think you need to look at those specifics. So I guess what we're saying is it's the dry years that are really going to matter uh, because that's when water management is most under stress and also when the impacts are greatest. So you'd need to look at those and then look at, well, what do we need? You know, can, can, you, can you introduce it? Better translucency into reservoirs, for example, uh, or you know, or, or, or are the environmental can environmental water entitlements do it? And, and if so, do you just need some more? Or you know, I, you know so I I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but the first point is to is to understand this problem better, work out its you know its characteristics. Now, I guess what I'm saying is these details and focus on the dry years is is what matters. Hmm. Is there another question from Peter Unmat? And I'll, I will, there's also chat in the exchange, but the, it looks like no, it's not really quest, questions I, in I the I noticed chat. Mark's, Mark's dealing quite well with the, uh, yeah. with so, the chat. Uh, so let Mark deal with the chat and I'll, I'll deal with the uh, questions. Okay. okay, Peter, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, thanks. Great talk. Um, it, this might be a little bit left to center here, but it seems like in the, in the popular political circles, the, the current solution is make our dam get, create more dams and make our dams bigger to capture these rarer high rainfall years. So they've got a bit better water security for the years after that. Um, I don't know, you got any thoughts on that sort of strategy? I mean, one issue I see is they had all the dams fill in 2016 and then three years later, they're all empty. So yeah. it seems like whatever water you give them, they're going to use. And they're not going to store it away for five years, three years in the future. So I, I don't know. You got any thoughts on whether that's any yeah, sort of well, so, so the first thought would be, so I, I was involved on a technical assessment panel for the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund, which was looking at things like new dams and other large scale water infrastructure to improve water supplies. And I couldn't believe the number of proposals that came there uh, that they all talked about taking at least 30 years to pay off because it was big money, billions of dollars, and yet very few of them looked at whether there was a payoff under a future climate. So that's yeah, that I mean that's the point I was trying to make. That's the the risk of that strategy uh, is that they they may be you know white elephant, they may be empty dams, they may not may not help. So I think you've you've got to you've got to look at uh, the full life of that infrastructure and, and is it sensible under the conditions that it's likely to experience. And, and oh, the other thing I just, it's, a, it's a anecdotal, but uh, we were told at CSIRO in that decision to do the desal plant that apparently there was a cabinet meeting where they were looking at dams. They were looking at building another dam for Perth. And then someone uh, broke through that conversation by just saying, we, we, they said, we have six empty buckets. We don't need another bucket. We need water. And so that's why they then went to a climate resilient thing. And then people you know, talk about all sorts of things against desal plants, but, but they're, they're probably better than uh, empty dams. So I, I do realise we, we are over time. So if people have to get going, do so. But there is one question from Neil. Um, 
Um, Neil, if you want to go ahead, and if people need to leave, then then that's understandable. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, Neil Lazaro here from CSIRO. Um, great talk, Ian, and, and thanks, Mark and, and Frankie, for the contributions to the paper. So um, I had a question, lots of questions, but I guess relating to, you know, this question ultimately of structural adjustment. So nationally, we've got a commitment to $100 billion um, agricultural industry this year. Uh, I think just a few days ago, the reports came out at 73 billion, so remarkable uptick in, in production relative to, to previous years. But we're still expected to uh, push that up by another 25% or more. 70% um, of our ag um, production is exported. So essentially, uh, what we're talking about in the, in the, talking about in the MDB is a, a way of exporting embodied water. Um, the really low value added uh, export product in the grand scheme of things. Um, and it's not ever really discussed in that, in that context. Uh, you know, there's lots of other things we can export which are much higher value added and you know, probably per litre of water get a much higher return on investment. So I think if we're, if we're thinking seriously about structural adjustment, uh, you know, the, the policies and some of the work coming out of out of UC, out of NATSEM in particular, you know, really talk about the ineffective and disjoint, uh, disconnected way that, that structural adjustment and economic and social policies in the MDB actually relate to the yeah. primary industry sector and community. So I think there's a lot more work to be done in that space. Um, but, you know, given, you know, un until we actually think about moving away from 100 billion um, farm gate production, uh, I think we're locked into to the kind of, uh, you know, chessboard that, that we're looking at now. And so how, how, interested in a response around that. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I, I guess point I didn't make in the talk is that as well as climate, there's a whole bunch of other things changing, you know, uh, the nature of agricultural production, you know, loss of family farm, uh, you know, demographic changes uh, that are going on uh, in global markets. So, it, it, it seems to me, then part of this sort of looking at things regionally, I was thinking, you know, that it, it should be part of a sort of more a broader regional futures. Now, each region thinking about, you know, rather than just more, you know, let's just keep doing what we have done, you know, uh, do a broader future scenario analysis and, and, and think about what what they, you know, what are the threats to the region and what they might want to, want to change. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I noticed in the in the in the written chat. So I, I mean, I just mentioned structural adjustment. Yeah, there's all sorts of huge problems with that. So I wasn't particularly advocating that. But what, all I'm saying is is that uh, that there, there should be you know, some sort of uh, regional, uh, you know, some sort of sort of policy on regional futures that, that complements the water one. So, but. One thing that people have said is that the uh, getting back to Ross's first point is one of the reasons the basin plan is is so unpopular. The basin plan actually gets blamed for a whole bunch of things that it has nothing to do with, simply because it is the most prominent plan out in those regions. Uh, if there were some other plans uh, about you know things like agriculture and is it really adding enough value and returning enough to regions and things, you you might actually get around some of the problems that have been falsely. Uh, Put at the feet of the basin plan. Hi, Ian. Right. Also, this. Um, if this is a quick question, then go ahead. But we yeah. we, we do need to wrap up. Yep. Okay. I just have one question. Hi, Ian. It's Santos here um, yeah. from CSRO. Right. I want to talk to you about your your six point thesis about this. Um, how we should be going about the basin plan, etc. I think there are those. The, Two points in them. Uh, the, the the thing that you talked about is uh, stochastic prediction, as well as the how do we uh, adjust to the climate change. That we are also kind of a binded by the lack of science, lack of the, our ability to do things. For example, in the case of stochastic um, prediction, 
you know, if you want to do it in a probabilistic way, as you said, you would have to come up with a probability and that probability will have to come from your old data, your historical oh, yeah. data. Yeah. So, um, and with, so, so what you have known in the past is the only that you can project in the future. You can't kind of uh, come up with some crazy... Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. So there might be some limitations to it, but it's... If, but the counterfactual is, is not doing it at all, just using the last hundred years and saying that's a good enough test. So you could, um, you know, be, you can relax various as assumptions, but, you know, what I'm suggesting is one is that the precise sequencing of events that you saw in history is something you might want to relax. You might still want to keep the variability that's there. Uh, and change the mean and things without, you know, relaxing everything and then asking yourself, you know, is your sense of what's your basis for that? What knowledge do we have? Uh, so I'm just becoming completely indeterminate. Uh, I'd just say we should be doing something a bit more than looking at the, the, the last hundred years. Yes. Right. Mm. So um, I, uh -huh. I have to go look after kids. You guys can keep chatting. Peter, can you Peter unmet, can you manage the um, questions and discussion, please? Sure, happy to. Thank yep. you. Can so I have I'm one happy to stick around for a, a few more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can I just have one more quick question, please? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, Ian, you also, you know, we when I was speaking about the limitation of our, our science, I also wanted to. Um, referred your third or second slide, which showed the future projections, and those varied from plus forty percent to minus forty percent. In one of those graphs that you you, yeah. that you showed, the second or third plot. Given that kind of uncertainty, how a planner is going to plan? Whether it's just like saying, "I want to plan for my future superannuation," and 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 the prediction that I have is that you die at, at 60, between 60 and 90. So with that kind of projections, how can I plan for my future? Oh, that's a, yeah. So that's a good analogy because people, because your future super balance is very uncertain. You don't know what your future earnings and what your future, uh, you know, returns on your investments are going to be. And there's quite sophisticated ways that superannuation schemes deal with that. Um, and you would make your own uh, investment decisions about, you know, are you going to put all your savings into super or something else? So, so uh, yeah, there's huge uncertainty in all aspects of, of life and people have quite sophisticated ways of dealing with that. Um, and so we need to have that similar level of sophistication in water management rather than, the, to be honest, what they've said today is, I don't know what the future is going to be like, so I'm not going to deal with it. But those who are telling us about the future are giving us such a broad range that it's unworkable. It's well, no, I don't believe that. I, so one thing, so whilst there's a, a large range in predictions, uh, there is a so quite a high probability that it's getting drier. Uh, and then the other thing on, on top of that, that I didn't talk about is the consequence. So that there are two mistakes you could make. You could overreact and pretend uh, you know things are going to get very dry and overreact to that and sort of limit water use or something or do a bunch of things, or you can underreact, which is what's tend to happen to date. The consequences are very asymmetrical, I think. Um, I think if you don't plan for future intense droughts and just end up having crises and, and uh, things like the fish kills in the, I think you're gonna lose social acceptance of the plan pretty as, as, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, pretty darn, quickly, as Ross said. Um, so, yeah, there's, so that given that, you know, so there's, a, it, it's more likely than not that it will dry and that the consequences of drying are far worse than the consequences of wetting. If it got wetter, uh, you could probably pretty well uh, get by with the existing management arrangements because when it's a wet year, everybody's happy. There's enough water for everyone. Uh, and, and so those sorts of things start to steer you uh, in particular directions and as I say you don't you can you don't have to decide everything now that's the whole point of the adaptation framework is, is that you might do prep work now and then say if things get drier by 20 percent we would do this rather than having and you do all that in a in a sort of calm 
uh, properly planned way, rather than dealing with a crisis, which is what we've tended to do in the past, and, and then that way you're just bringing on water restrictions and telling everyone they can't do anything. Thanks, Ian. I'll, I'll throw in a quick question. This is, this is totally, absolutely left of centre, but I, I presume you're enjoying retirement. My, my question was a bit around, you know, how much political interference you think there is in influencing CSIRO outcomes? Uh, I don't think there's much political interference in CSIRO outcomes. Um, there's... So, so you feel the organisation is pretty independent of uh, politics? And interference outside? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, Ross, I don't know whether Ross is still there. We sort of talked, Ross talked about this in the water get together a few weeks ago. And, and the, so there's, those, there's a debate going on at the moment about whether the science community is, is because of uh, the need for external funding, whether the science community is captured uh, by the current politics. Um, I, I don't, as Ross said, you know, there, there are various things you can put in place to ensure that doesn't happen. Uh, and, and, uh, and I know they were being put in place. Uh, so, for example, one, uh, an insistence on, the, on being able to publish work, whether the uh, is now written into contracts. So whether the, the findings of the research are you know, favourable to the current policy or not, uh, they can get published and things. Uh, so now, you know, but on the other hand, it does come, as I said, with, with responsibilities. So as, as I mentioned to Ross, you, you don't want to just be putting out, uh, so that's why we were pretty keen not to just to put out a paper that says, you know, basin plan doesn't deal with climate, bad luck. Uh, you know, you, you're wrong. Yeah, it, it's then incumbent on you to say, well, is that a fixable problem? And how would you go about fixing it uh, and things now. So whether that gets taken up or not, uh, that's outside of research and things. But um, yeah, I, I don't see a lot of political interference in, in you know, whether you, what topics you can actually research and that sort of thing, and whether the research can, can proceed independently. Well, that's good to hear. I, I really do think that's overstated a bit. Any other questions from anybody? I suppose the other side of that is, is I think as in that debate we had as Ross and um, Fiona both pointed out, what the problem is why you don't see that is a lot of those is it's often sensible to have those difficult conversations about say how well adapted a basin plan is or something to climate change. It's good to have those, uh, you don't have those conversations through social media or, or the mainstream media, if you really want to make a difference, uh, you go and have those conversations with the managers and you, you might, and so you find it's a lot more nuanced. They say, yeah, yeah, we know some of this stuff, but you know, we're not able to do it yet. And you, you might think of ways you can start approaching the problem and that, that sort of thing. So that a lot of the good work that goes on in, in sort of influence, science influencing policy goes on quietly in the background and actually has to happen that way or happens more effectively that way uh, than, in, than in the newspapers. Anyway, that's, so that'll, that'll do. All right, well, thanks everyone. Glad, uh, thanks for that uh, debate, that was very good. Thanks very much, Ian, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think yeah. everybody thoroughly enjoyed it and we really appreciate your time. Yeah, okay, thanks, bye. Thanks very much. Thank bye -bye. you, Ian. Bye. -bye.